Today, I would like to uh, continue uh, our uh, learning here with ANSYS Workbench. And uh, I think by now, uh, you've done quite some uh, exercise in using beam elements. And uh, you've done that for homework six, seven, eight, and nine. Uh, last time I introduced solid modeling, uh, and I would like today to go over that again one more time and uh, make sure you have everything you need to be able to uh, work homework number nine, uh, which is the very same problem for homework six and homework five, but we're going to solve this problem using solid elements. So in order to use solid elements, we are going to be creating a 3D geometry. We're going to be creating 3D geometry. So the problem that uh, we want to do is the one that we've done before, which is this of the two cylinders, A, B, B, C, that make one part, and this part is fixed at A and is allowed to go through an axial displacement of 0 0.002 inches at C. Both AB and BC are circular sections. AB has a radius of 0.178412 inches, and BC has a radius of 0.21851 inches. When uh, we use beam elements, beams are 1D, and basically we created a geometry where we can fit this 1D element. Today, when we are going to be using solid elements, I'm going to be using 3D geometry to fit within this 3D geometry solid elements. So we're going to be doing 3D modeling. Now, uh, your 3D geometry may be imported from any CAD package, or we can use Design Modeler. And one of the objectives is I want you to get familiar with using Design Modeler to using Design Modeler to be able to create or edit this 3D geometry. And uh, in Design Modeler, you're going to be working primarily in two modes, modeling or sketching. Modeling or sketching. So if I have a sketch, I can then extrude it or revolve it to create my 3D model. So uh, it would be great if you have a copy of ANSYS Workbench and you can follow along with me as I go step by step from scratch. Uh, that's what I plan to do for today. So I have uh, uh, a blank uh, project, unsaved project that uh, going to start here by uh, saving as, and I'm going to call it, I'm going to save it on my answers directory. And I'm going to give it today's date. So I'm going to say 2020, 10, 15, solid, oops, okay, okay that's fine. So 20, 20, 10, 15 solid, that's my project. Before I do anything, I'm going to go check my units. And I'm working in U.S. standard units uh, using inches. So I'm going to go U.S. engineering. I'm going to select that. And uh, I want to also show you that you can choose how you want to display your values. You can display values as defined or display values in project units, which what I want to make sure we can verify these numbers. So now I'm ready. Next, I'm going to start by creating a static structural analysis. So from the analysis systems, I'm going to come here and pick static structure. I can double click on it or drag it to the project schematic. And now I'm going to go through the steps. So I've defined the static structure, number one. Number two is I'm going to define my material properties. So I'm going to double click on engineering data. I'm still within workbench. I'm going to add a new material. And I'm going to call it solid. 
an example. Now I want to define the properties. I'm going to define this material from the toolboxes. I'm going to pick isotropic elasticity. If I double click on it, it opens here the properties of outline row four for the solid example. Primarily, I want to put my models of elasticity of 10 million PSI or one E to the seven PSI. Poisson's ratio, I'm going to put a point three. And um, just something to uh, remember, uh, working with 3D model, I'm expecting to capture both the elongation compression as well as the radial change in the geometry. So Poisson's ratio is going to affect the result sum. And uh, we would like to see uh, the difference in the results between the 1D model, the hand calculation, and the 3D uh, or the solid using solid elements. So I'm done here with my engineering data. I'm going to go to geometry and I want to make sure not to double click but to right click. If you double click by default, it's going to open a new space plane geometry. But I use a right click because I want to use a new design modeler geometry. So I'm going to select new design modeler geometry. And you can see here it says starting design modeler. So it is launching design model. Here comes design modeler. And uh, I'm going to just move some of my toolboxes to allow you to see more of my screen area. You do not need to do that. I'm doing it just because I am uh, magnifying my screen. So now I want my part to be aligned along the x-axis like we did before. And uh, I'm going to decide whether I'm going to use extrude or revolve. I can create my parts either or. So if I want to extrude, I'm basically going to create two sections and extrude each. If I'm going to revolve, I'm simply going to create a profile and revolve it. Uh, if I'm going to use the revolve, I'm going to create a profile in the XY plane. So let's try this today. So I'm going to come here to the in the XY plane. So I select my XY plane and I'm going to look at it. So I'm looking at the XY plane and I'm going to start a new sketch. So I, I, click, I click here on new sketch. So now I have a sketch one that is under or on the XY plane. And uh, before I do anything, I'm looking here at my ruler and my units are displayed in meter, the default. So I'm going to go to units and change these two inches. Now, the part I'm trying to create is 22 inches long. So looking at this, 200 inches is too much. So I'm going to zoom in to get something more adequate. I'm also going to be working primarily in the positive x direction. So I just move here my coordinates. Looking at this, let's, this looks like good. And I'm going to start by sketching the profile. So I'm going to toggle from modeling to sketching. And I'm going to start by doing the profile and I'm going to simply use a polyline. So I'm going to be sketching multiple lines. And you want to pay attention here to the constraints. I'm starting at the origin and you can see if I go on the axis, I see the letter C. I want to touch on the or start at the origin. So I want to see the letter P where I'm constrained to a point. So I start here and I'm going to move up and I want to see my V. And uh, if I see my V, I'm going to also see a C. Because I'm going vertically up, I'm constrained to the Y axis. I'm going to click. And I'm going to go in the horizontal direction. And I want to go about 10 inches. 
So here I want 10 inches. I'm going to click, left click, and then I'm going to go up vertical. Click. Then I want to go 12 inches in the horizontal. So I go here, roughly 12 inches, click. And then I want to go vertically down. And I want to see V and C constraints. So V, and I want to see the C to make sure I'm back to the X axis. I'm going to click. And now I'm going to close my profile. So I come here, I'm seeing my P, I can click, and I can end that by using a right click, and I say close end. So here is my profile for my part. Now uh, I want to put my dimensions, so I'm going to come here and say dimensions, and I'm going to select general, and I want to start with the 10 inches, and then the 12 inches. Then I'm going to put my radii. So I'm going to come here and put the radius. And I'm going to come, let me zoom in a little bit. And I'm going to select here and put the other radius. And now I want to make sure to edit my dimensions. So H1 is the one that should be 10 inches. So I'm going to go look at the details of the sketch and put a 10 inch here. Enter. Now H2 is 12 inches, so I'm gonna come here and put 12, okay. Uh, next, if I look here at uh, R1, is coming here as V4, so I'm gonna put here the radius, which was 0 0.178412. This is my R1. I also want to edit my R2, which is V3. Come here, this is V3. So I'm going to edit this and put a 0 0.21851 inches. So I updated the dimensions and as you can see here the difference is small as you recall the first section a b should have a cross section area of 0.1 square inch and bc had a square area of 0.15 square inches so this looks good as far as dimensions and you see the color of my sketch changed to the dark blue when I defined the four dimensions, indicating that is uh, properly defined, is properly defined. So now I can uh, generate my sketch. If I go to modeling to see the tree outline, now I have a sketch that is defined. I still do not have any parts or bodies, zero parts and zero bodies. So. What I'm going to do is I'm going to come here. This is in 3D. I'm going to choose to revolve now. So I'm going to go revolve. And it's created here a revolve. And I need to select a geometry, which is going to be my sketch one. I'm going to say sketch one and say apply. And I also need to select an axis about which I'm going to revolve my profile. So if I go look in the Z direction here, I want to select my x-axis. So I'm going to come here and select my x-axis and come here and see apply. Oops. Now we're going 360 degrees. So whether I select from here or select from here, this is the positive x-axis. It should be okay. So I'm going to go in the positive x-axis and go apply. And I'm going to leave this at 360 degrees to go for a full revolve. Now, uh, everything is defined here is good. I'm not going to touch anything else. I have my sketch one, my axis to the edge, and I have add material and direction is normal. And I have 360 degrees. So I'm going to go generate. And here comes my 
part. You see here, I created one part and one body. Created one part and one body. So I have here a solid. As you recall, when you were using beam elements and creating lines, our bodies were line bodies. But here I have a solid that I just created. You can look at it in 3D. Here is the area where we can see the change in the geometry. Okay, so we are happy with uh, our part. Uh, before we move on and leave the uh, design modeler, I would uh, like to show you that uh, in SketchUp, if I go back to Sketch and toggle to Sketching Mode, uh, if you would like in a set to sing H2 and V1 and V2, you can go to Dimensions and choose how you would like these displayed. So I can come here and go all the way down and choose display. And I can choose, for example, value instead of a name. So now when you look at it, you see the dimensions that we've defined. So it really depends on how you would like to see it. Okay. So we are uh, happy with our geometry and this is what we wanted to achieve. Please remember, I don't have to define any cross-section. I'm not using any line concepts. So I don't have any line bodies. We simply have one solid part. I can uh, save my project. So I can come here and say save project. So my uh, project is saved and next, I'm going to go to model. So I double click model to start mechanical. So it says here starting mechanical. So I have workbench. I had design modeler and now it's going to start also mechanical. So here comes mechanical. And by the way, if you want to toggle between them, if you go here, you see now static structure that's DM for design modeler and the static structure, and this is mechanical, M for mechanical. So I can go back and forth uh, uh, here as, as you can see. So I'm gonna go to static structure. And the first thing I wanna do is I want to assign my solid, the material that I created. So I'm gonna go under geometry, I'm gonna go select solid. And if you go in the detail of solid, you see material assignment, and it's taking the default structure steel. So we want to change that to solid example material. So now I made sure that my part has a solid example. Next, if I go to my mesh, and uh, if uh, I choose generate, we can take a look about what kind of a mesh is going to be able, but the automatic mesh generator is going to fit into this solid part. So I go generate. And here comes my mesh. And please note, I didn't change anything. I just accepted the default mesh setup. Now, uh, if you're looking carefully, you're going to see that this is an approximation. If I look at my mesh and the elements, I'm not capturing all the curved edges of this cylinders. So we do have quite a bit some flows. And this by itself is going to compromise the result some. So let's continue and just keep that in mind. I do have a decent mesh, uh, reasonable element sizes, but uh, you look here, there are uh, bumps here and there uh, around the surface where it's trying to fit this, these uh, tetrahedral elements within the solid part. And again, this is one of the approximations that are inherited in the finite element method. And these are some of the few things I want you to be able to look at especially after we have a little bit background in finite element method and know how the method works. So we're not just dealing with a black box and we don't know what's happening. 
Uh, of course, like we did beam elements by hand or uh, rather bar elements, we could do solid elements. And some of you who are gonna take the graduate course in finite element method are gonna be exposed to these elements. Uh, but for now, you just kind of have a general idea and understand how the uh, finite element method works. So next, I'm going to go, I have my mesh. I'm going to go to static structure where I can define my supports or constraints as well as my loads. So I'm going to go to static structure and I'm going to fix point A. And point A in solid modeling is represented by a face. So now I do have an actual face. So if I uh, rotate here, this face right here represents point A. So the point A in the beam will represent a section or a face that I can see here. So when I, I want to fix it, I'm going to fix that face. So I'm going to go to supports and I'm going to choose a fixed support. I have here the tail of fixed support expecting me to select a geometry. So I'm going to select the face that represents point A and go apply. And this is a fixed support applied to point A. Also, one of the things about the numerical method, uh, you get some stress concentration. Anytime you have a fully constrained surface next to a free one, and these are not uh, very accurate. Yes, we can have high stress here, but we're going to get excessive stress concentration around this area. So this is something to keep in mind. So for example, if I'm looking to the average stress in AB, I should not select a point around the fixed support. I should be looking more between A and B to kind of get this, an idea on the average. Next, I'm going to go to the other end where I had a wall that allowed the part to displace a point zero zero two in the X direction. So I'm looking here at my face, at face C, at point C. And you see the mesh here is not really the best. Now, uh, of course, using ANSYS, I can refine the mesh or edit it to create a better mesh. Uh, this is probably gonna be beyond what you need to do in this class. I can just demonstrate it if you're interested, but uh, for now, let's keep what we have and see what we get. And then we're gonna take care of that. So I'm gonna come here to my supports and this time I'm gonna choose displacement. So under supports, we have few op options. Uh, including fixed, frictionless, displacement, remote, compression only, cylindrical, and elastic. So the one I'm going to be using is simply displacement, like we did before. So I'm going to select my geometry and go apply. And I want to define my displacement. Right now it's free in X, Y, and Z. So we want this to have a set or prescribed displacement in the x-direction of 0 0.002. I notice here that this is a meter. So you want to be watchful for your units. So I want to go to my, change that and fix it. If I go to home and uh, go to display, home and then go to tools, I have units and I want to change this to US customary inches and I want to make sure, okay, so US customary inches, degrees and radians, that's fine. Uh, so these are all the units that I need to define. Now when I come back to my displacement, you look here, this is not what I want, so you want to be careful. Because if your units are not correct, your answers are not going to be correct. So I'm going to change this from 0 0.07 inches to 0 0.002, and I have here inches. So now this is my prescribed displacement. Then uh, we still want to apply the load. So I'm going to come here, and this is where we want to apply my force.
And again, I don't have a point, but I do have this face where the two parts meet. So I'm gonna apply the force here because I don't have another way to put it on the inside. And uh, yes, this is gonna generate some stress concentration around these elements where the force is directly applied. But you also have to recall that in real life, if you have a part like this and you're gonna load it, most likely you are gonna be loading it to that area. Maybe you're gonna have like uh, uh, another part that attaches to this face and uh, connects here, and this is how the load is gonna be transmitted into the part. So this is better mimic what we see in real life, but you just have to be aware of this area of transition where you see fine elements close to some, closer to some larger elements. And uh, again, this transition may not be numerically the best. And I'm gonna show you when we look at some stress results. So I wanna come here and go back to static structure and go to my environment and choose simply a force. Yes, I have few options for loads, but I just need to apply a direct force over the face. Yes, I can apply it as um, a, hydro, a, a pressure that is perpendicular. So I can put this as just simply a pressure, but then I have to divide the force by the area. If I simply choose a force, <coughs> excuse me, mechanical is gonna distribute the force over the area, which is what we wanna intend to do here. So I'm just gonna go for a force and a detail of a force. It's expecting me to select a geometry. So I'm gonna select the geometry here and I'm gonna go apply. Uh, if you look carefully, it selected an edge instead of the face. That's not what we wanna do. So I'm gonna go back to geometry and I can force it, force the selection method to pick a face. So I'm gonna go in a face and now I'm gonna come here and select. This is what I want. I want to apply it to this green face. So I'm gonna go apply and the geometry, one face is selected. When I'm defining my force, I do not want to use a vector. I simply want to use components. I'm gonna change components. Now I get X, Y, and Z component. The force that is applied on this was one kip. And uh, let me really show you here. We had 1,000 pound force applied at B. So this is our problem. A, B, C, fixed at A. We have this uh, prescribed displacement of 0 0.002 at the right end. So I'm gonna go back to my mechanical and I wanna put here my force in the X direction and I have 1,000 pounds. See here the units, I have 1,000 pound force applied. So this is my force applied. If I wanna look at uh, a summary, of what I did for static structure, I can go select static structure. And you see, I have a displacement at A. I have a fixed support. And again, A, B, C here do not represent the points I had on my sketch. They represent uh, an icon that is showing where the force or the, the, uh, the support is being applied. So A is really at C and C is at A where I have the fixed support and the force is applied at B. All right, so we are uh, done here with defining everything and uh, we can check is our part is properly constrained and we're gonna have a solution or not by simply clicking solve. So if I click solve, it is solving 85%, solving the mathematical model and it's done. You see, I get a green check mark, which is mean there is a solution and my part is properly constrained. Now I wanna define my results that I would like to look at. So I'm gonna go to solution. And usually when I look at the results, I like to look at this deformation. So I'm gonna go to deformation and I can look at the total deformation which is get, simply gonna show a magnitude at every point. I can also choose to do deformation and choose directional. 
because primarily I am interesting in the direction along the x-axis. You see here it says orientation, x-axis. I can pick any other direction, but I want to stick to the x direction. So this is directional deformation. And I want to show you something here in the solution from the outline. I can come here and right click on the result that I define and choose rename based on definition. So now the name of this result became x-axis directional deformation, right? At the end time, that's fine. So I have here deformations. I'm gonna get a little bit more specific using probe. When uh, we were asked to solve this problem, we were asked to find the support reaction displacement at B, as well as the stresses in the parts. So I'm gonna use the probe to find the reactions. So I'm gonna go select a force reaction and I'm gonna select the reaction at A would be at the fixed support. So I'm gonna select, please note here when I'm defining my probes for a force reaction, the type I'm using a force reaction and then the location method is boundary condition. I wanna keep the boundary condition. Uh, there are some other options here you see like uh, there is a ge uh, geometry selection, contact region, remote points, beams, frames, mesh, surface. I just want to keep the boundary condition. It's very easy to go here and select the fixed support. And we know the fixed support was at the left end, at the left end. So here I defined my first force reaction. I can come here, by the way, and rename it and say force reaction at my A to relate this to my problem definition. Next, I'm gonna go again, define another probe for, for another force reaction. And this time I wanna look at the force reaction at the end that displaces, displaces 0 0.002 inches. So I'm gonna select boundary condition and select displacement. So you see my force reaction is gonna be calculated at the right end. Again, I can come here and rename it and say this is the force reaction at C. I also want to find the displacement where the two parts connect. And this is a bit tricky here, especially that the force is applied to that face. So yes, I can find the average displacement of that face. But if I want it to be more representative, because this face may get a little bit crushed, I can even select the average on the edge. So let's, let me demonstrate that. I can go like probe and I can select here the formation and I want to select a geometry and I wanna make sure I can select an edge. So I'm gonna be specific and come here and select this edge and say apply. So I have a geometry selected and I want to go for the deformation along the x-axis. So I put a probe here, and this hopefully would be representative of what's happening at B. Okay, so this is a deformation probe. I can rename, it says x-axis deformation, and it says solid, or I can come here and choose my own name, and I can say, x-axis simply deformation. So I give it to one. Okay. So we have the force reactions. Now, please keep in mind that uh, with these being solid elements, I'm not using beams, I no longer have the option to look for axial forces. You look under tools, toolboxes, I don't have any beam defined. So my beam tool is grayed out. So I don't have this option. But what I can look at, not axial forces, I can look directly into stresses. So if I go to results, I can look at stress and I have a big list of different types of stresses. If I want to look at the one we calculated by using the normal force divided by the area, I would be simply looking at an axial stress or a normal stress. He says here, it says a sigma. Insert a normal stress object to plot component of normal stress in a given direction. So I can put, put here a normal stress. 
and the orientation is in the x-axis, which is what we want. So we're going to be looking at normal stress. Of course, we can uh, compare that. I can come here and also define evomesis stress. So if you're going to be using a failure theory and want to see whether your part is going to make it or fail, I can choose to go for an equivalent stress. So I added here a normal stress and an equivalent stress. Uh, we can also look at strains. So I can look at uh, strain and under strain, I can also look at the normal strain, which is going to be representative to our deformation along the x-axis. Let's get these first and look at the quality of the results. And if we need to add anything else, we can. But I think these are going to be sufficient for our purposes here. So in order to get these um, results, I'm going to either, I can right click and say evaluate all results or simply click solve again. And here comes our results. So let's evaluate what we're getting here and see if they compare at all to what we got when we did it by hand. So I'm going to be looking here and I, for simplicity, I'm just going to be looking on the Z axis. And as soon as you looked at the deformed shape, is this what we expected our course to do? No, we were simply expecting this to deform primarily along the X axis. But this looks like getting some bending. Yes, there is exaggeration, and this is not primarily what's happening. If you look at the total deformation, compare it to the X deformation, I'm just toggling here between these two. The maximum that I'm getting is 0.006 in the X direction. If I look at the total deformation, I'm getting 0.007. So yeah, there is probably 10% extra getting a contribution from translation in other directions, but primarily everything is happening in the X. And as we expected, the maximum is happening around B. If I want to be more specific and look what happens at B, I can look at X axis deformation at B, and there should be a number that I can read here. And uh, let's look at the number. I'm getting here 0.00, 0 0.0597 inches. If I compare that to what I got when I did it by hand, we were getting 0 0.0055. So this number is slightly higher than what we got when we use beams or did it by hand, but it is still within acceptable limits. Now, uh, should we have decided to look at the deformation at, this at, the, at the face instead of the edge? I bet that the number would be greater. And this is something that we can do to observe it. So if I go to solution and uh, go to a probe, and let's say I'm gonna look at the formation, and this time I'm gonna select the face instead of the edge. So I'm gonna come here and select this face and apply and make sure I select the X direction. And let me evaluate this. So I'm gonna come here and say, evaluate the result and look at the number I'm getting here. You can see here I'm getting 0 0.00609 compared to 0 0.0059. So it is slightly higher. It does take the average. But if I uh, choose the edge, if I come here to the one that I'm playing with and uh, change the geometry, and instead of having a face selected, uh, yeah, I think this is already calculated. So let me create another one quickly. Solution and look at results. And uh, no, let's take a probe, put a deformation, and uh, select the outer edge this time. And go apply and look at the X axis and uh, solve, and let's look at the definition. That's not bad. We are still getting a 0 0.006095 compared to 0 0.00597. So there is a very slight difference between the outer and the inner. Now, uh, I also have to mention that uh, should you 
choose to extrude your part, it may affect the way your mesh looks. I do not expect everyone to get the same mesh and the same results. The numerical approximation is going to be different depending on how your part gets mesh using the automatic mesh generator. Let's look at the other results. Uh, the first reaction at A, I'm getting 546 pulling the part, which uh, you may recall when uh, we did it earlier, we were getting like 555 pounds. Let's look at the force reaction at C, and I'm getting here 453, pushing the part. And uh, when we did this uh, problem using classical methods or using the finite element method, we did get 555 and 444. So I wanted to show you here the comparison, 444 versus 453. And uh, here I have 546 versus 555. So we are within the vicinity. This is an acceptable error. Next, I want to look at my detailed deformation. If you look here at uh, the deformation, I'm getting my maximum here, I'm getting zero, and I'm getting the displacement of 0 0.002 at the free end. Of course, the numbers are going to match here if I look at the x-axis directional deformation. And uh, uh, this is all, if you look, all the numbers are positive. So while everything is moving in the positive X direction, I'm still getting tension in the AB and compression in BC, which we can better see when I look at normal stresses. So when I look at the normal stresses here, and uh, you're gonna see for yourself where I get stress concentration because of the shape of my elements fitting into the part. So this is an interesting area here, which you can see we do not have a very fine mesh and we're not getting, we have these sharp edges and I get some high stress values that are really not representative of what we got when we did this problem by hand. When I did it by hand, I'm getting 5,500 and uh, 56 PSI. Uh, now I'm looking here and uh, at the areas where I get to have stress concentration, these red areas, and I can show the location of the maximum. If I go here under probe, there is maximum. So if I go click the maximum, I'm getting this maximum high stress concentration where the two parts intersect you see that stress concentration. Now, uh, of course, we have the force directly applied here, and we also have the different size elements that connect together where the parts intersect. So definitely there is room for improving the results should somebody refine the mesh. Uh, I'm not expecting you to be able to do this in this class, but it's something that I'll be happy to demonstrate at later time. So, uh, the one thing I would like you, if you take like a general look at this, primarily my part AB is kind of in the orange. And if I use my probe to kind of find the results here, this is within what I expect, 5,556. I'm getting here almost 5,500 on average. So if you look at the stresses here, the orange ones, 
and getting something within this vicinity. If you average these numbers, you're gonna be good. Of course, if I click on the red, that's not what I wanna see. And this is here a very good example of how errors can uh, result from using an inadequate or improper mesh for a part that is relatively thin like this part, okay? So these are normal stresses. Uh, of course, if I use my uh, probe and look at the other part that is in tension, so I use my probe and I look here, you can see here they are in compression. And again, the number that I got when I did it by hand was 2,962 compression. And I get quite a variation. Again, this, as we know, this is a two force member and the compression in the part should be the same extending from point B to point C. Of course, unless we have a direct effect of the force right here, so the stresses are gonna be higher. And yes, indeed, they are higher, but there is exaggeration here due to numerical errors. Someone is particular about this, should use a fine, a very fine mesh in this area to better capture the behavior and make sure your force is applied like it is applied in real life. All right. Now, uh, with this being done, you should be able to do the same to complete homework number uh, uh, nine that uh, is due tomorrow uh, by midnight. And uh, actually I'll be happy to extend the deadline to Sunday to allow you more time to work on it. Uh, so this uh, assignment is the same uh, problem you've done before, uh, but uh, simply it says here, use ANSYS and solid element, ANSYS workbench and solid elements to model the structure and find the reaction force at A, displacement of D and C. In addition, the axial force in A, D, actually uh, I would uh, say for, uh, don't worry about the axial force and I'm gonna fix that. You really want the axial stress in AD, DC, and CD. And it's no longer direct stress. We're just looking at the normal stress. We're gonna be looking at the normal stress. Um, so you are using solid elements. There is no results option for axial force since we are not using beam element. You can calculate normal stress, same as axial stress. Uh, this should be pretty uniform within each member away from stress concentration. And I say here, you may use the probe to figure it out at multiple locations. This should give you a good estimate for axial stress within each member. If you multiply this stress for each member by its corresponding cross area, you will get the axial force. So this axial force that you're gonna calculate is not gonna be directly from workbench, but it's from taking the axial stress that in beams we call the direct stress and multiply it by the area, the cross-sectional area of each member, then you can find the axial force. Uh, please note the relation between axial forces and the support reactions, right? The axial forces should average to the support reaction. So alter alternatively, we use equilibrium of forces and force reaction to find all the axial forces in the member. So again, this is quite a bit like you're gonna be using some, doing some calculations to kind of make more sense of the results when you solve a problem uh, uh, for the homework number nine. Okay, I think you can see better now. So this is again, your, the problem that you're familiar with. So instead of having, again, you can use a profile to revolve or extrude uh, do three extrudes because you have different cross sections. Now, if you're doing extrudes, uh, you're gonna have three different bodies and uh, you can assign line uh, cross sections, but please make sure before you leave design modeler 
to form a new part, form a new part out of three, uh, of three bodies. So you're gonna end up with three solids that makes three parts if you're using, especially if you're doing add frozen. If you're using add material, then you should have one part only. 